Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So Monish Pabrai uh, was a guest at Clemson University on January 27th, which is about a week and a half ago. Uh, today is February 7th. Uh, and as always, when he's a guest at a university, you know, usually he delivers a bit of a monologue and then does a Q&A. And I love to do kind of a highlights video just to drill the lessons into my head from the talks that he gives. So that's what I'm going to do today. Let's go through my highlights from this talk by Monish Pabrai. Um, so, you know, he starts off saying, back in 1994 is when Pabrai discovered Warren Buffett. Okay, He had been running his own business for a handful of years at that point. Uh, and, you know, wanted to get into investing. So he just devoured Buffett, um, like from a fire hose. And he says, you know, the years 1994 and 1995 were his years of greatest learning, right? It was just so much coming at him as he was devouring everything he could find from Warren Buffett. Now, 2020, just last year, a year that many of us would like to forget, uh, was the second biggest year of learning for Monish Pabrai. Uh, and there's really two resources that he pointed to in this talk of why uh, it was such a big learning year for him. The first one was Nick Sleep. Okay? Nick Sleep was, uh, ran a fund from, I believe it was like the year 2000 to 2013. Uh, and Pabrai read through uh, Nick Sleep's letters to uh, investors from those years. And just really, it, it caused him to kind of change his whole approach to, you know, what he's looking for in his fund in terms of investments, um, which is a huge change for someone who's been managing money for 25 years to suddenly, you know, make a, a pretty dramatic change. So um, the second resource you know, Nick Sleep was the first one. The second one is a book called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. Uh, and that was written by Thomas Phelps back in 1972. Okay. So like, what is that? 49 years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm more familiar with the book 100 Baggers, which was um, written by Chris Meyer. Uh, that was kind of the sequel in, in a sense to that original by, by Thomas Phelps. Um, but it, it did inspire me to um, buy 100 to 1 in the stock market and go deeper into that to try to tease out some lessons. He says, you know, Thomas Phelps really did a good job of explaining a lot of nuances uh, when you're hunting for these 100 baggers. Um, and then he goes into a little bit about what he learned from Nick Sleep. So he gives the example of Walmart. Walmart went public in 1970, okay? So 51 years ago. Um, the Only the Walton family has held since that company went public. There aren't any investors who have owned Walmart for 50 years, okay? And Pabrai says there probably aren't any investors who have owned it for 40 years or even 30 years. You know, maybe some have owned it for, for 20 years, a, a couple decades. Um, but, you know, it really gets to this point of, you know, the, the best investors aren't, you know, aren't really investors in the traditional sense. Uh, they're entrepreneurs who never sold, okay? Very long-term business owners, owners of, of great businesses. Um, so he, he asked two questions here. Which, which I think are uh, interesting to think about. The first, if you owned Walmart in 1980, okay, let's say you didn't get in right at 1970 when it went public, but you bought in in 1980. Uh, what were the set of facts that caused you to sell it, right? So that, that's an interesting thought exercise. Um, obviously, every company has ups and downs. Uh, maybe it seemed like it hit intrinsic value uh, in in the mind of whoever was holding it, and that was the time to sell it. But it's just a, it's an interesting thought exercise. And another thing to think about, if you owned Kmart, right, 
kind of one of Walmart's competitors. Uh, what were the set of facts that caused you to keep it, right? A uh, business that wouldn't go on to do nearly uh, as well as, as Walmart over the decades. Um, so that, that's, that's an interesting thought exercise. Uh, so really in 2020, Pabrai decided even better than buying a dollar for 50 cents or 40 cents or 30 cents is to own great businesses for a long time. Okay, that's his new you know, modus operandi for Pabrai funds. Um, like I said, the best investors are entrepreneurs that never sold. If the business is getting better, forget about the valuation. All right. Uh, of course, Pabrai used to try to buy at 50 cents if it was worth a dollar, sell around 90 cents, maybe wait until it hit a dollar, maybe until it was a little bit over a dollar. Um, but if it's a great business with a great management team that's, you know, skilled at capital allocation, uh, leave it alone. And Charlie Munger uh, talked to Pabrai, Pabrai about this not too long ago around Costco. And now Costco seems like it's pretty overvalued right now. It seems fairly frothy in terms of the P.E. ratio. Um, but Munger has no interest in selling. Okay. And that's not something Munger can justify, um, you know, by, by kind of a, a rational explanation. It, it's just, you know, some, some deeper wisdom that uh, it seems like Munger has tapped into. And, you know, it's the same thread with Nick Sleep. You know, if you own a great business, let that business make you rich, okay? You don't have to keep flipping these investments in order to get to the promised land. So that was Pabrai's uh, kind of talk before the Q&A. Let's get into the Q&A. Uh, so first he was asked, what's your take on GameStop and what's happening with these highly shorted stocks, right? You know, you've got uh, AMC, BlackBerry, Nokia, all of these highly shorted stocks with Seritage seems to be uh, in that mix as well. Uh, so what's Pabrai's take on that? And, you know, he goes back to something he's brought up many times. It is the nature of auction-driven markets uh, for prices to fluctuate widely in the short term, all right? Uh, if you look at any given stock in the stock market and you look at the 52-week low versus the 52-week high, uh, the high is probably going to be at least twice as much as the low, right? There's a big range. Uh, but business value does not fluctuate this much, right? It's the nature of these auction-driven markets that prices fluctuate significantly more than the underlying business value. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the explanation he gave of what's happening with GameStop. It's kind of an extreme example uh, of this. Obviously, there's me some mechanics with the short squeeze, uh, he does talk about shorting. He says it's a very dumb activity to short stocks, okay? Uh, and those of you who have followed Pabrai for a while, you know he gave a talk a couple of years ago uh, called The Ten Commandments of Investment Management. And one of those commandments was thou shalt not short. Uh, and the reason is the best you can do when you're shorting a stock, right? If you're straight up shorting a stock is a double. If the stock goes to zero, you double your money, okay? That's the best you can do. Uh, the worst you can do if, you know, you get in into a short squeeze, like what's happened with GameStop, is it can go, what, I think GameStop was like $5 a couple months ago. And I think it broke through $400 a share. So, you know, imagine you have this 80X when you're shorting a stock you're going to be bankrupt, most likely. You're going to lose all of your money. So, you know, in order to win this game, this, this game of long-term compounding, this game of investing, uh, we have to stay in the game. If we get knocked out, there, there's no way to win. Uh, and so if we make bets like shorting stocks where we have this asymmetric downside uh, versus upside, we're not going to stay in the game very long. So... Uh, Pabrai will never short a stock. He will take that to his grave. 
Um, there is a market distortion currently in heavily shorted stocks. Uh, there's also uh, market distortions. There's bubbles happening in, you know, Pabri says about a dozen Robinhood stocks, kind of the, the most, you know, frenzied Robinhood names that all these Robinhood investors are piling into. Uh, probably the best example being Tesla. Um, and then SPACs, he says SPACs are in a bubble, okay? And I, I have a little bit of experience in SPACs, uh, but I play it very differently than, than most people. Um, I don't get in when I see the price rising. I get in, you know, as close to that kind of cash value as I can. Uh, and then right when it pops, when there's a deal announced, I'm out of there. So that's, that's kind of how I'm playing SPACs. Um, he says beyond those areas of the market that, that seem to be, you know, in, in bubble territory, uh, low interest rates might be able to justify a lot of the prices we're seeing out there for, for uh, a majority of these stocks in the U.S. that seem much higher than they have been recently. But if interest rates stay low um, over the next decade or more, uh, they could be very well be, you know, not not in bubble territory, at least not too overpriced. So that's Pabri's take on that. Uh, he was asked, what's your take on impact investing or ESG investing, which is an area that I'm really interested in. And I've never heard Pabri asked about this before. So I was very curious how he was going to respond to that. He basically said, it's better to separate capitalism and doing good in the world. Okay, so Pabrai, you know, his, his philosophy here is that you can't optimize two variables at the same time. One being kind of maximizing return on your investments and the other being uh, doing good in the world. He, he thinks, you know, you should optimize your investing activities and then you can do good in the world uh, through philanthropic efforts, which... Pabrai has clearly separated. Um, you know, he's got Pabrai funds and he's also got Dakshana Foundation. And, you know, there, there's, there's no kind of intermingling of the two. They're, they're separate endeavors. So it was interesting to hear his take on that. Um, that said, he said he wouldn't, he doesn't think he'd invest in a tobacco company. So there are some areas that are kind of just too far out outside of, of his personal values, uh, tobacco companies being one of them. Um, perhaps gambling being another one of them, like investing in casinos, for example. But it sounds like there's not a lot that would be off the table for Pabrai in terms of uh, investing uh, money in the Pabrai funds uh, into. So, you know, it, that, you know, it doesn't impact my interest in kind of investing in companies that are involved in decarbonization, uh, the transition from a kind of a high carbon energy uh, culture that we're in now to a kind of more sustainable economy. I'm still very interested in that. And I talked a little bit about that in my video from a couple days ago. Or was that yesterday? Yeah, I think it was my video from yesterday, the Q&A. So Check that out if you want to hear more uh, of my perspective on that. So moving right along, what are you expecting in the market over the next year? Okay, you know, I feel like he always gets asked this. Um, there's a lot of people who think, yeah, the, the markets seem really frothy. Surely there must be a correction right around the corner within the next three months, six months, year at the latest. Uh, but Pabrai is the first to admit he has no idea, right? And he doesn't try to predict the unpredictable. He thinks that's you know, a waste of time. It, it's not uh, a productive activity for him as an investor. So he says he's never paid attention to what might happen with the market. He says micro will trump macro. So focus on individual businesses, uh, businesses that you can understand and you know, forget about trying to make predictions in the macro environment. It's too hard. Um, he doesn't 
have any superior ability to time what's going to happen in the greater market. So uh, he focuses on the businesses that he's interested in. You know, do I understand them? How will they perform long term? Okay, a very business level focus, which I think is great advice. Um, he talks about an investment he made in Turkey in July 2019. The general macro scene in Turkey was that foreign investors were exiting en masse. Okay, uh, there were currency concerns, political leadership concerns. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about how things were going to play out in Turkey. And so there were a lot of foreign investors who were getting out of there. Uh, and of course, as a value investor, those can create some of the most compelling investment opportunities, right? Um, it's that contrarianism that's kind of built in to us uh, value investors. So he found this warehousing REIT. Um, he could buy the entire company for $40 million, okay? Uh, and based on how much square footage of warehouse that company owned, uh, you're essentially buying warehousing space at around $3 per square foot, right? That's the equity piece. Now the debt on that real estate was about $17 per square foot, okay? So much higher debt than, than equity. Uh, the liquidation value of those assets, of those warehouses, uh, was around $50 per square foot, okay? So you got $3 in equity, 17 in debt, 50 in liquidation value. If you had to just, you know, fire sale those assets, um, $50 a square foot. So for every $3 you're putting in, uh, you get $33, all right? Which, which is amazing. That's a, an 11x opportunity there. Um, there's a father-son team. So that wasn't even the most compelling piece of this investment for Pabrai. There's a father-son team who ran the business who were exceptional capital allocators, okay? Uh, so not only do you have, based on the current fire sale prices for these assets, do you have an 11x opportunity, but you've got a growing pie, right? You've got this management team uh, that's you know really skilled at um, reinvesting these profits, right? These earnings uh, to grow the business. So you've got a growing pie, which is exactly what Pabrai is looking for. Uh, and the currency thesis that a lot of these investors had in Turkey did kind of play out. The Turkish lira collapsed by 40% from July of 2019 to today, like a year and a half. Uh, the Turkish lira collapsed by 40%, okay? Uh, the currency of Turkey lost 40% of its value. To Pabrai, it didn't matter if the currency being used was seashells. I love that quote, that was fantastic. Um, in dollar terms, he's up six to seven times since the summer of 2019. So that's incredible. A year and a half, he's up six to seven X on this investment in Turkey. Wow. I hope he's able to find a lot more of those in countries that I can invest in. I haven't figured out how to invest in Turkey um, as a U.S. resident. So if you guys have any tips, uh, hit me up on that. So uh, the big question, how well does the management team run this business? That's really all that matters, okay? Forget the macro. How well does the management team run the business? Uh, not what will the markets do in the next 12 months? Not what's happening with GameStop? What's happening with Tesla, right? What's happening with the local currency? What's going on in crypto? You know, it's, it's very focused. Find these businesses. Um, ideally that are both, you know, trading at a huge discount to underlying value, which is the case here for this Turkish company, and is a, a long-term compounder, right? Great management, great capital allocators, a growing pie. So that's the whole game, guys. It's the whole game. Uh, he's asked, what do you think of Bitcoin? I don't know that I've ever heard him asked that as directly as well. 
Um, so I loved his answer here, uh, as usual. 99% of the stuff that goes on in this world, I do not understand, okay? Uh, that's perfectly fine because I only need to understand what I invest in. So there's so many things, you know, Tesla, Bitcoin, that have just taken off in the last couple of years. And Pabrai is perfectly comfortable saying, I can't understand those things, right? So, you know, whatever happens to them, I'll look on interested, right? I'll, I'll eat my popcorn and watch these things play out in the markets. But somehow he's able to kind of shut off this FOMO that a lot of us have, um, which which is fantastic. It, it's, a, it's an incredible quality to be able to do that. Uh, and I wonder if it's a learned skill that Pabrai has or if it's just something that, you know, he's he's had for a long time, this ability to sit on the sidelines when there's something you don't understand, but it's just taken off. Um, it's it's pretty impressive. So, uh, yeah, Bitcoin, he's, you know, if he were forced to either be a buyer of Bitcoin or a seller of Bitcoin, he said, you know, he, he just wouldn't be able to buy Bitcoin. It's, uh, he just thinks it's too... It's too speculative. There's nothing that he can really sink his teeth into in terms of value, in terms of what it's worth. Um, so I thought that was interesting. He was asked, what have been your biggest learnings in 2020, right? Second biggest year of learning for Pabrai. So what has he learned? Nick sleep, set it and forget it approach, right? And this is a top priority for me personally is to go through uh, these nomad partnership letters. And I'm going to link to these guys. Uh, I found this site on the internet. You can download, you know, I think it's like 13 or 14 years of Nick Sleep's uh, investment partnership letters. So I am going to read through these. I'll probably make one, maybe more videos about them. Um, but I, again, I will link to that in the description if you guys want to read along with me. Uh, that, that'd be fun. Um, so Nick Sleep said it and forget it. Buy the great companies. Ideally, as early in the in the game as you can identify them, and you know, go on vacation. Um, Nick Sleep outperformed just about every manager Pabrai knows of while doing virtually no work by identifying, you know, early in the game that Amazon was going to be a great business, a great long-term compounder. Costco, a great long-term compounder, and Berkshire Hathaway, which, you know, Berkshire Hathaway doesn't take a genius to figure out that it's a long-term compounder. Um, but, you know, because it's done so incredibly well over decades, uh, it's still hard for a lot of investors to invest in Berkshire Hathaway, right? It seems kind of too obvious. Uh, it's easy to think, you know, Buffett and Munger are kind of out of touch with um, you know, the best investment strategies today, you know, in, in modern times. Um, but obviously still an incredible compounding business. So um, the learning from Nick Sleep was that when you identify and find these exceptional great businesses, which have very high returns on equity, so we're going to get a little list of what makes these great long-term businesses very high returns on equity, very long runways. Uh, and I consider that to be a company that can really grow. Uh, it's kind of total addressable market, okay? Um, very great managers, very deep moats. When you identify those, what is that? One, two, three, four things. You go all in, okay? And ideally you try to find them small and then you set it and you forget it. Um, you don't, you know, try to value them every quarter and sell them when they've reached intrinsic value. You understand what you have and you let it do its thing. You step back, right? You become an entrepreneur who never sells. So uh, that's the big lesson for Pabrai in 2020. Um, and I guess these are similar threads to what uh, Phelps talks about in his book, 100 to 1 in the Stock Market, uh, which is another book I'm going to be taking a deep dive into. 
Um, but I'm going to read Nick Sleep's partnership letters first. Uh, and again, it's not necessarily it's not necessary to do a precise calculation of intrinsic value. That's really the buying a dollar bill for fifty cents approach. Um, it's not the long-term compounder approach. I mean, obviously, you have to have some idea about what the value is today, um, but certainly doesn't require a spreadsheet to come up with that. Um, and then he was asked, well, now that you've changed your approach, right, and you're you know, just finding a couple of these great long-term compounders, what are you going to do with your time? And of course, Pabrai you know, is in the very early stages of kind of changing course of this aircraft carrier, right? This massive th entity that is Pabrai funds. Uh, some of these 50 cent dollars still have to play out. So it's going to take a couple of years to really transition Pabrai funds from buying 50 cent dollar bills to uh, owning you know, a portfolio of these great long-term compounders. Um, but that gets me really excited, guys. And you know why? Because I am a shameless cloner, and I will be watching what Pabrai does over the next couple of years. And, you know, I'm anticipating he's going to be finding some really interesting long-term compounders. So this is a very exciting time to be watching what Pabrai is doing to be looking at his 13 Fs, uh, to be looking at ticker terminal where it shows, you know, his international uh, investments. Uh, recently, one of which was Shinikin. Uh, I did a video on that, um, I think a week or two ago. Um, so that's it, guys. Awesome stuff again from Monish Pabrai. And uh, let me know what your big takeaways were from this awesome talk that Pabrai did at Clemson University, his alma mater. I think it's the first time maybe he's ever done a talk at Clemson. Uh, so that was kind of cool. Anyway, guys, let me know what your biggest takeaways are. Read these Nomad Investment Partnership letters and let's uh, really share kind of our, our insights about them as, as we go along here. All right, with that, I will see you all in the next video. Take care.